Hello and welcome to Mostly Minnesota Music uh, Podcast Edition. I'm Ann Tracy. I'm here with my co-host. Heather Baker. Yeah. We are here with Ryan Sturgis. Ryan, thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You did something fun and exciting last week uh, with a video that released and Rolling Stone. Tell us about it. Yeah, it was a really fantastic opportunity for me. Um, I have been doing video production uh, in one form or another for about 15 years now. Uh, I worked originally in New York uh, on, on independent films, which is where I found my love for video production. And I've done a lot of different stuff, but um, one of the main focuses I've had is music. And, and um, I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of different musicians, many musicians right here in Minnesota. Um, and in the last three years, I've had um, a little bit of a, an expansion out to some really incredible artists and I've had the opportunity to do documentary style video production uh, and interview artists like uh, Charlie Watts from the Rolling Stone and Mick Fleetwood and Elvis's drummer DJ Fontana was one of my favorites you know some just really incredible people um, and amongst that journey you know I had this opportunity to meet this band the Empty Hearts and they're kind of like a super group you know if you know the Traveling Wilburys or it's like all these musicians from the 60s got together and just did a band they, they, they're kind of like that except they're all, they're all from bands from the 80s so it's the lead guitarist from the cars whose name is elliot easton and it's the drummer from blondie his name is clem burke and then the lead singer from uh the romantics and his name is wally palmer and then uh my my good friend andy babuke uh who's the guy i work most closely with on our projects. Uh, he was the bassist from a band called the Chesterfield Kings. And they all got together um, in the last several years to do music that they really, really love. You know, they've all had really successful careers um, and they are very much influenced by that uh, British Invasion 60s sound. And so their, their band, The Empty Hearts, really has that feeling. There's my cat scaring herself. Uh, <laughs> My band, yeah, that band really has that that feeling, but then it's got some like, you know, 80s rock energy injected into it as well. Um, and so I was working with them about a year ago. They had just cut this album, which is their second album. It's called The Second Album. And they- <laughs> Very clever, I love that, I have to say. It's clear at the very- I love it. <laughs> and usually, you know, with an album, you write the album, and you record, and, and then you record the album, and then you know maybe you'll do a video or two, and then you'll release the album, and then you'll go on tour. Well, nobody is going on tour um, right now because of COVID nineteen, and so um, we had done the two videos with them, um, and when this hit, Andy from the band called me and said, "We can't take the." the album out on tour. So we want to do some more video. And what do you think we can do? You know, we can't get the band together. We can't, I, you, I can't get on a plane and go work with them in LA like I did uh, for the first two videos. We can't do a big production. So it was a really cool conversation because they were looking at the album and they were trying to figure out what songs they wanted to release videos for. And the um, head of the label which is called Wicked Cool Records. His name is Little Steven. And he is from the Bruce Springsteen E Street Band. He's yeah. also known as uh, from The Sopranos. Yeah. Um, Sopranos. And then he's got this crazy, awesome, weird Netflix series called Lily Hammer. So he's like a very eccentric dude, really cool. And he, he, it was his suggestion to go with this song, The World Has Gone Insane. Um, because it was really apropos. Uh, it was written a year ago, right? And so it's one of those songs that takes on a new meaning um, after some time. And not that much time had gone pa gone by when, when COVID hit and everybody was kind of feeling insane. So that's a song we decided to go with. And the process for the video was basically, they said, here's the song, here's the list of the lyrics. They gave me creative control to do what I could do. And I just started to, um, you know, I listened to the song a bunch and I started to think about, you know, what, 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 what are, what are a series of political and pop culture events that either contributed to us feeling 
insane or, or spoke to, you know, this insane feeling that I think a lot of people are having um, right now in 2020, um, you know, and part of that is definitely due to COVID. And then some of it has to do with a lot of other underlying cultural issues, right? Um, and so I was, when I was thinking about what could represent these lyrics, I, I was drawn back to the 70s. And that's when I, that's where I started the video with the Nixon era. And really mm -hmm. the reason for this is that I, I, I think there is a big uh, sort of starting point for some of this insane, insane feelings that I'm having, you know? Um, and it's, it's when, it's when Nixon separated our currency from the gold standard and money sort of took on a new power in our culture. And a lot of the video is about what money has done mm. to us and how it's affected what we, you know, how it's almost replaced the bottom dollars almost replaced a morality in our culture. Um, and that's where I wanted to start. And then, you know, then I got to have a lot of fun and I tried to keep it broad enough so that, you know, regardless of what political affiliation you have, you can at least agree that most of the things you see on there seem a little crazy. Um, you know, it might lean a little to the left, um, but okay. it is what it is. And, <laughs> and, and, and it was really, really fun. It was a very cathartic thing because I was here, um, you know, in quarantine and doing a lot of homeschool with my seven-year-old. <laughs> and, you know, and, and things had stopped pretty abruptly for me. Um, most of my work was on the road, you know, popping on a plane and following the music and sure. things had changed a lot. So it was a really great project to get the call for. So uh, when you presented the video to them before it was released, what was the feedback right away? Well, they really loved it. And, you know, there were a few things we had to go back and forth on, you know, there were this, there was a lot of imagery in the, in the, in the video and it's all, um, you know, it, it's all pretty uh, fast, but there were some things in there, you know, that we talked about, is this really the right message, you know, and, and I was really kind of flying on the seat of my pants with it and just feeling what, trying to, trying to, trying to emulate my own feelings about what the lyrics meant to me. And so for the most part, they really loved it. Uh, little Steven, who's the one who says yay or nay on it, thought it was really great and said something along the lines of this is what music is supposed to, to do, you know? And so he, he really loved it. And um, it, was a, it was really awesome for me because their feedback was really, really positive and inspiring. And um, you know, so we made a few tweaks here and there, you know, like I had a shot of the Red Hot Chili Peppers in there. and The band doesn't love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So I pulled it out, you know, there's a, so, it, it, and it's all fair use stuff, you know, because the, 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 the internet is such a wild west these days uh, and it's all fast enough and it's all commentary. So, you know, there were a few discussions about, should we use this, that, and the other thing, but mostly they loved, um, they loved how far I took it and, um, they, you know, felt like it emulated what they were feeling when they wrote the song. So that was really cool. Yes. Do you have some favorite moments? Yeah, you know, um, well, they're very, the band is a huge, uh, they're all huge fans of the Beatles and they actually had Ringo Starr on one of their songs for this album. Wow. He recorded the drums for them on a song uh, that's that's going to be released on the album, um, and that comes out on August 28th. Uh, so they're all huge Beatles fans, and when we were shooting the, our first music video that that I did with them, we we had Beatles music on in the background, you know, as we were shooting, um, and it was really fun. So I I I started the video out with the day that the Beatles broke up. You know, it was the it was the headline. Paul left the Beatles, and that was sort of a um, a little you know, secret nod for those guys saying everything started going downhill and the Beatles broke, you know, so that was kind of a cool uh, little moment that I, that I enjoyed there. And then, you know, it was fun. I re it was fun seeing some of this stuff from the nineties that was really impactful for me because those were my formative years, you know, 
Um, and, and just recognizing some of the pop culture that was happening in the 90s that was already speaking to some of this stuff. You know, Virtual Insanity is a, a music video that I tossed in there for a moment. Um, films that, that happened a little bit earlier in the video, like um, I, I put a clip from Taxi Driver, from Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver in there because there's a, a you know, an, an American story of insanity. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think the strongest part for me is, this, is the, the bridge of the song, the guitar solo, where I really drew a line between the richest and the poorest in our country. You know, there's a, a juxtaposition made between people living in these decadent mansions and jet skiing around their yachts and you know, people just off the same shore moving their tents around so they don't get arrested. And to me, um, that's really what it's about. You know, if I had to pick one thing, again, it's, 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 it's what money has done to our culture and how much of an imbalance it's created. Um, and, I, and I honestly believe that that's contributed significantly to how we're all experiencing COVID-19. Uh, and I think that that really speaks volumes that issue speaks volumes to why we're having such a harder time with this than many many places um on on the globe so that was that to me is what feels the most insane right it seems not real if it's numbers in a computer um you know and it, and it allows some people to live so well that they are miserable because of how much they have and then you know keep certain people down so far that they're miserable and sick you know so to me that's really i think that that's what i wanted to articulate um and then of course you know the 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 lyrics in the songs talk about the news and they talk about the radio personalities and all this stuff all this you know noise that we hear um so it was fun to sort of pick those faces out you know and sort of say this is who's contributing to this noise uh, you know, you've got Rush Limbaugh in there and you've got the Fox News anchors and, and you know, the, the, the leftist news as well. You know, there's a lot of sensational is a sensationalism that happens in the news these days. And um, that I don't think is helping, you know, on either side. Um, no. So, yeah, the, there were it, it was such a cathartic thing. I mean, it was so much <laughs> of real like in time. I'm feeling these things right now process um that so to me that's what is so awesome about this project because it really felt like it was really connected i was really connected to the project itself um so it was really cool to know that something that i was putting a lot of my heart into you know out here in mankato from my attic office in my home without seeing anybody else you know had the opportunity to through Rolling Stone, the Rolling Stone article, you know, find its way to the biggest, m most adamant music fans in the country. You know, that was really exciting when I got that news. So that was fun. I was gonna I say, kind of, oh, sorry, Ann. I was, I was just gonna. I, I don't think I have heard anyone so succinctly say that really the difference between us and other countries who have had and have kind of gone beyond the COVID issues is that it's the straight up money. And you know, replacing morality with the money the way that we've done. I that it's this really well said. It's really thanks. Well yeah, I do feel that way. You know, it's like if 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 you if you um if if what you do is going to save you money or earn you money, then you have a lot of excuses, you know, to not consider other things, right? You you basically have this free you know, get out of jail free card when it comes to morality or um, consideration or, you know, quality, right? We have this issue every, every, all of us experience this issue every day. Quality doesn't matter. It's, it's what it's, it's, it's dollar value, right? And that really, I think goes up the line uh, to things as large as um, our, our, our general sense of morality in our culture. Um, and it's sad because it's not that because because nobody's winning right no one's actually winning because yeah. you reach a certain point 
in your in your bank balance and you automatically become a very sad individual <laughs> you know it's like just part of it you know it's like it's like it's like growing up it's like a squirrel growing up in a nut factory if you don't if you can't go earn something you lose you've lost something right mm -hmm. so and i i recognize i get to say i say that from a uh from a um a place of privilege too you know i i have a lot uh going for me um and you know i guess i guess i think i feel like i have a responsibility to talk about it since i do since I've got the time and the, the privilege to think about it and um, talk about it. So that's what I was trying to do with the video. And it was really nice to have the opportunity. No, I think it, I said, I, I just, I think it hits really, really spot on. I mean, so that the time that you spent going through, I mean, you, how long did it take to go through all those videos? It must have been. It was, hours. it was. It was a long time. It was, it, you know, it took me, a, it took me all told the project took me five weeks. Um, and, you know, that's certainly not like I was working on it all, all the time. In fact, I was working on it mostly uh, after my kid would go to bed, you know, or I'd pull out a few hours here and there if she was, because at the time she was um, mostly home and she's an only child. Um, and our, we don't have grandparents around either. So, and my, you know, my wife is an amazing mom and she hung out with her as much as she could. And I hung out with her as much as she could. And there was still time where she, you know, had to hang out with herself. Um, but, you know, I did a lot. I started by listening to the song. You know, I spent a good week just listening to it and writing down ideas uh, and bullet listing. You know, I use my Google Docs every day. So I write something in there every day, whether it's a Facebook post or a concept for a story or, you know, questions to an upcoming interview whatever it is so it's that, that that part was fun and then and then the editing was a, a long process because it it actually evolved significantly while I was editing it because of what I found you know um I would go I, I'd have I'd have an idea I'm going to start from the 70s and I'm going to in the beginning you know I'd, I'd take it a stanza at a time I, and this this stanza is going to be in the 80s then we'll get up through the 90s and then we'll be in real time right by the time the lyrics drop in um well you know it was like it took me long enough just to find this stuff from the 70s to make that work you know and so I had to shift it around a little bit and um the capture of material that was out there on YouTube that I could find uh was a pretty arduous process and I, I don't know how many hours I put in but I can tell you that I do lose time in the editing room I it's kind of one of those things where I feel like it's I'm I'm I'm, I'm like fully aligned doing editing work I love production and um but you know i can feel my you know i can f I, I i'm aware of what's going on when i'm doing production i love I, I lose myself a little bit when i'm interviewing people because i get so interested in what they're going to tell me you know and i kind of go down a rabbit hole when i'm editing i'll be like oh i haven't eaten or used the bathroom in six hours you know so like that does happen to me and that happened a bunch and it was awesome because I wasn't doing any other work. So it was really nice. just a beautiful thing. So yeah, it was really, um, it was a labor of love and certainly, um, you know, more time than I think I was hired for or was expected, but that's pretty much par for the course for me when I, when I get a project that means that much, you know? It's nice to talk thinking, about it. Uh, this is really great. Sorry, I was gonna say, I feel like you could ask him to have a part two or a continuation because I'm sure there's so much more you would like to add or from where you stopped, you could add now too. Yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff didn't make the cut, right? Um, and yeah, there and there were things, you know, I, I do want to talk about the ending because that was really important for me. You know, the very last section of the video i took the feeling and in the opposite direction you know i've been I've been articulating things that i think are really um upsetting and 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 kind of make us feel all all feel crazy or insane um you know and that are a little disconcerting to see all in one place right um and then 
for that last stanza in the song, you know, really the outro of the song, um, I chose to take it in a different direction mm -hmm. and talk about things that I think were on the right track with. And so I, you know, I, I did image, images of TED Talks, which I think are really amazing, you know, documentaries that are coming out that are so informative and help us see things um, in a sing, for, through a single window, you know, that, that provide us a perspective, you know, um, choosing to find a way to live in symbiosis with nature you know there were imagery there's imagery of city and and and, and nature coming together um uh greta sternberg shows up at the very end because of her generation and her capacity for change you know that she's making because i and 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 um you know i put imagine in there John Lennon, again, to talk about, to, to circle us back to the Beatles, because there's a lot of beautiful things said in that song that we've really ignored. Um, and, you know, vote, critical thinking, all of these really important things that we're, that, that we are doing and that, that, that many of us are working to support in a really strong way and are working for and working towards and, you know, are using in a fight against some of these other things that I consider to be part of the insanity. And, you know, there were, there were a lot of things I would love, love to put in there. You know, there was Neil deGrasse Tyson was one that I really, you know, if I, if I had, if I had redone it, I would have put him in there, you know, uh, and it, he just, you know, he was, he was part of my, my big list and you're just sort of folding things in, you know, and, Oh God, it's time. They need the thing, you know? And so there's part yeah. of that. So there are, there's plenty of stuff that, you know, I think it, a project like that, you could work on it forever and you could, you could adjust it and you could remold it and reshape it. Um, and, and that's true for pretty much any project I've ever done. Really. I mean, at some point you have to say, here's the, 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 uh, the exclamation point at the end of it. And um, that's always both really gratifying and always just a little bit sad because there's always something else that you could have done. And, you know, maybe there'll be another opportunity to speak in the same way. I am going to be working on other music videos with the band. Um, this was really just the first, uh, apart from the first two they were planning on doing. Uh, I'm editing two more right now. Um, for the band and I'm really excited to that you know they're not quite as um, they're a little bit more light I think I would say um, and really really fun uh, and you know it, the process of figuring out how to get all the creativity that I'm used to having in my work right here from home has been exciting in a lot of ways because I'm kind of I'm, I'm reaching sort of like a middle passage in, in some ways in my, in my life where I'm like, I, I can't be on the road at the same level that I have been in the past year. So I'm really excited and exploring this idea of how to pivot what I'm doing to more work in the editing room and creativity from the editing room and doing some of production right here from home. So I'm, I'm outlining right now, a, um, like a, either a YouTube channel or a podcast. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe something similar to this uh, about social justice in cinema and, you know, um, analyzing films uh, that have spoken to big social justice issues, whether they're documentaries like 13th uh, was it this incredible documentary that came out uh, last year that was just blew my mind. It was about, uh, the 13th Amendment, and then, you know, films like Bombshell um, that came out uh, last year that were that was about the Roger Ailes uh, lawsuit at Fox News and, and even old classic movies, you know, like uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington or Someone's Coming to Dinner, you know, these, these incredible pieces of cinema, which I, is my favorite thing on earth, you know, is, is good movies um, and how they have affected social justice so i'm loving like this idea of maybe i can do all the stuff i that you know the, all this fulfilling work that i love to do uh you know right 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 from here if i need to you know what i mean but one of the classes i took as an undergrad was film and politics yeah 
And, and, and the, it was Mr. Movie. Smith Goes to Washington. That's the one I remember. And I, it's so funny. I can't remember. I mean, it was, it wasn't two years ago. You know, it, was, it was a long time ago, but it was, it, it really was fascinating. It was an unusual class for me to take because mostly I was always a, a theater goer, not so much a movie. But so you should tie it into a class situation or, you know, it, it kind of get conversation going that way. It'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, and I'm learning a lot about that because there's so much success happening on that stage, right? This this online learning and conversation and class, and I just I think it's I think it's cool. You know, it's a tough thing that we're dealing with right now. It's hard to be away from people. It's hard not to be able to go to restaurants and to go over to people's houses and hug one another and you know live the way that we're used to living with people because we need people. Um, but man, what I, I'm sitting here right now having a very enriching conversation, you know, and that's fulfilling too. So it's like, it's kind of, it, and, and we're, we're learning, uh, we're learning how to do this across barriers that we have not been able to do it across before, which I think is a good thing. I think we should all learn more about each other. And this certainly is a good way to do that. When did, when did you start on this project. And I, I guess I'm asking that in terms of <laughs> given, given May 25th, given the, the murder of, of George Floyd, were you, had you started, were you in that process? What impact did that? Cause we, the pandemic and then the George Floyd and then the, you know, and yeah. how, yeah. Well, how, how did that fit into your schedule? <laughs> I was working on it. And so I, um, I, it was, it was right before I, sent in my first draft that I put uh, George Floyd and 100,000 deaths. And that had just all happened, um, you know, and, and it was, yeah, I was working on it. I had already been working on it for a couple of weeks. Um, and I worked on it for a few more weeks, or, you know, a couple more weeks after that. Um, and I was, and in fact, um, it was initially it was initially sent to Rolling Stone. The first publicist that was taking the video, um, he ended up getting let go, and I don't we don't really know what exactly happened, but um, he, he got let go from the project. But um, you know, it was almost we we were almost concerned that it was too close to home originally. Hmm. Um, and I don't think that ended up being the case. I think you know it came out about a you know, about four, three or four weeks after. Yeah. And um, it was, you know, when, when, when it, it, when we started showing it around to people and it, it, I think that people were excited to have something that was that timely. Um, there was a little bit of concern about the, you know, separating two things, something as enjoyable and fun and, easy as music, you know, um, that's coming from a band that's pretty harmless and, you know, doesn't certainly hasn't made a, a, a name for itself by being political, right? right. That's not, that's not who the, how they identify themselves as. Um, but, the, you know, they wrote this song from the heart and it was, um, it, it, it was more true now than it had, than it, than, you know, for them even the feelings grew. The feelings that 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 they had that that they put into the song had evolved and grown. You know, this feeling of insanity had contributed had been you know contributed to further. So when that with for them it was really amazing because they had these emotions and feelings and they wrote it into the song and then those feelings grew and we were in the middle of all of this and then I was able to put visual to it and it matched how where they were at. You know. Um, and it's just because of what was going on, but yeah, it was, it, it was in the thick of that, you know, I was in the, I was in the thick of the project when, uh, the George Floyd, uh, tragedy happened. So, you know, it was folded in, you know, this is it, this is what we're talking about. This is what this is about, you know, and this is, it's incredible what what the door that that has opened for the country and for the world you know and the window the view has changed i think and i think that's amazing and i think i think that's i think that's a lot 
think I think that um, video has played a real part in that, right? Mm -hmm. Just this idea that we can see this happening. We we now know clearly how much it's happened uh, throughout the ages. Now we can see it. We can hear it, um, and it changes the way that 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 the that the wide world feels about this kind of thing um if it's in front of us and we are emotionally connected to it it, it obviously has a bigger impact on us and i think you know people have been very good at covering this kind of thing up and i don't think that's a possibility anymore which i think is a, an incredible thing and so um it you know to have that video which is what really made this splash right be in this video seemed um really important It's only there it for is. a second, you know, like the rest of it. But it's only it was only there for a second, just like the rest of it, because, um, you know, I wanted a, an array of things to and and a, and, a, and, a, and to do it in a way that, you know, just touched on all of this stuff. And the point of the point of it isn't to look too hard or too long at any of it, but to see it all um, in one place. But subsequently, it is a story that you could watch again and again and again and see something. I, okay, I'm going to have to watch it at least six or seven times through before I don't stop on Clockwork Orange because that would be my, it's like, oh, well, like, oh, I, I'm in, I'm in. It's, uh, but the nice thing about that is you're going to have a touch point with everybody and everyone's going to have a different touch point and that, you know, that, that's able to draw them in, I think. Yeah, that was really important to me too because we all have different perspectives on you know, what's good and what's not and what makes us feel crazy and what doesn't. Um, and, and uh, you know, th there are a lot of things that speak to that feeling throughout our culture and in our politics and in our news, um, but they don't always affect us all in the same way. So I really thought it was important to try and get a broad scope um, of what could contribute to that feeling for different people. Um, and, you know, that they would have some fun, you know, scoping it out as well. Like you say, like it is, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's so quick that it's fun to rewatch because, and the song is great. I mean, the song is yeah. just fun to listen to no matter what. Um, and that's part, I think that's one of the things I love the most about it is that it's serious and um, it could be, a fun experience as well, you know, and I think that's important. I think, I think that kind of balance, if you, I think having that kind of balance when you have commentary is important um, because otherwise if it's too much of a downer, people won't engage with it, right? Um, so I like the fact that it was a great upbeat poppy song right. and that we got to speak to some not so upbeat poppy ideas uh, with it. And that was fun. Well, it's interesting. You, you had said, you know, it's a band that's, it is not by design meant to be political. That's not their, that's not their thing. But in Heather and I have talked to a number of bands now that have come out with, I mean, I think Turn, Turn, Turn with their Can't Go Back. And then we talked to Why, Why, Why. And his whole album is, and the, this is music that was created before, before. Right. <laughs> and it's coming out now and I you know I, I've life imitates art art to imi imitates life and I, it's going to be interesting to see what comes out six months from now I think there was absolutely absolutely I mean you know there are things that are contributing to the the the, the disease the virus itself is a natural thing and it occurs um, it doesn't care what we're thinking or feeling. Um, it, our excuses don't matter to it. It's one of those things that's just part of nature. Uh, how it affects us as a culture and how we handle it comes down to what we are as a culture. And I think a lot of people are keyed in to the fact that we are an un, there are unhealthy things that we have about our culture that um, s suddenly now it all makes sense, you know, when you listen to the lyrics of the songs of, from these artists who were experiencing this, recognizing it, putting it into their art. Now we sort of have this 
indicator, you know, that, that comes from outside, that comes from a completely separate place than anything we can invent. Um, it sort of shines a light, right? It shines a light on these things in a way that we can't escape. Um, and nobody can escape it. No matter how good of a liar you are, you can't escape the, the truth, you know, of this natural uh, force. And that, as tragic as it is, you know, could, could lead to um, a little bit of a healthy cultural movement, potentially. And I think it's cool that, you know, there's these artists who are speaking to some of these issues. Um, and now this is, this has come in and sort of, you know, made it even clearer, a lens that's made it even clearer. I don't know, maybe, may, maybe that's what's going on. Could, it, it could be, um, you know, sort of that collective awareness too, you know, where people um, from California and Nashville and New York, uh, you know, they all have a similar idea all at the same time. That happens in, in music and in art of all kinds. And that's always cool to see as well. Can I ask how you, um, now I'm getting off the more serious topic, but how you um, found yourself involved with the Empty Hearts Band? Yeah, yeah. So um, about three years ago, I uh, met a photographer. He's a rock photographer who is originally from Norwood, Minnesota. He was here at MSU. My wife teaches theater at MSU. He was here um, doing a keynote speech uh, for the music industry students. And I, I, had, I had a studio, at that point I had a studio downtown here in Mankato and it was a recording studio and it had a stage and we did a lot of video production out of there. Um, and I had the, the music industry students as part of their curriculum come down and do an event uh, or I guess they did three events um, per semester for a, a year. It was part of their work that they were doing. And so this photographer, Rob Shanahan, came to my studio and gave his keynote speech there. And I was just amazed because he, he has an incredible resume. He's worked with, um, you know, he, he was Ringo's personal photographer for over a decade. So wow. he worked with um, the Rolling Stones, uh, the Ringo and Paul. He's also worked with Aerosmith and, you know, he's got some younger artists like Lady Gaga and uh, just pretty much all around, you know, photographer to the, to the music stars. And, um, from Norwood. And so I asked him if he was going to be around long enough to do an interview because um, I just, I love interviewing people. And if there's a story there, I, you know, I want to get it. Um, and from that, uh, we ended up going to, he was around for a while, for a few days. So I ended up going up to Norwood with him and doing a little documentary just in a single day shoot just around where he grew up. And we went to his high school and went to his old house. Um, you know, we kind of cleared the schedule and just, just jumped in, in, in the car and went out there. And then I actually was, took a road trip to LA a couple months later. Um, and when I did that, I called him up and said, Hey, I, I cut this edit of, of our day in Norwood and would love to have you see it. And he, um, we met up and I showed it to him and he really loved it. And he was like, this is so great. I can't believe what you came up with, you know, from this day. And I said, okay, awesome. Well, what do you think about, you know, building on off of this and doing a documentary project, even if it's a, you know, short documentary project. So um, that was my uh, initial um, relationship into the, 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 national stage for the music world. And I went around shooting his photo shoots with him for a while. And that's when I met DJ Fontana, um, who was Elvis's drummer who passed away a couple months after I interviewed him. Uh, I was with Rob when I got to do this four hour long interview with probably the, the most frequently recorded drummer of all time. His name is Hal Blaine. He was in um, The Wrecking Crew. And so every song that you heard on the radio in the 60s 
um, you know, 50s and 60s, it was this recording band, right? It was the band that did their tours and that were on the music videos and on the movies and all this stuff. But it was this band that played their song when it, for the radio and for the albums. And you just had all of these incredible stories about, you know, the birds and the mamas and the papas and Simon and Garfunkel. And, you know, so it, and, and um, it was a really wonderful experience to, you know, shoot, Rob shooting his um, subjects and then, you know, getting a chance to interview these musicians uh, for that project. And, you know, once, once you've done some of these older legends, you know, you, you really, the, the musicians that I've worked with since all love those guys, you know, they were here, they were here, they're heroes, right? Um, so um, even, even Charlie Watts of the Rolling Stones was how Blaine fan right so like the best of the best still loves still thinks somebody else is better you know and that's and and the guys who really make it you know in 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 whatever they do whether it's music or whatever most of these individuals mm -hmm. um are really humble incredible people you know who just had a passion big enough um you know i've run I, I, a few a few unnamed artists I've run into had egos that were, you know, too big for the room, but not most of them, you know, most of them, most of them were, are really down to earth, um, accomplished people who figured out that if you have an ego, you don't get far and you don't get that far. You know, if, if you bring your ego to the recording session, um, you aren't going to get invited back, you know, and, and, and so that was really cool. Uh, you know, to discover that and to hear that come out so many different times in you know, all these different interviews, uh, that, that the best of the best, um, you know, really understood, understand that um, you got to check that, that, that junk at the door. And I, you know, for whomever I've interviewed in my life, I've always gained something from, right? It, it, I, you can't not, um, you know, whether it's a small nonprofit organization from Mankato or, you know, uh, somebody like Mick Fleetwood, you gain something. Um, and it's cool. It's, it's fun to, it's fun to gain the wisdom of, of people who have lived these, you know, kind of high lives and, and exciting lives. Okay. Now you're triggering a question. What, what is one of your favorite interviews that you've done and why, yeah. or what stands out? Yeah. Um, I think, I think so. I, that that Hal Blaine interview was definitely in my top three, um, and why is because he was almost ninety. He's passed away now, um, and I was actually at his ninetieth birthday in L.A. and I have footage of him playing the drums for the last time. And wow. the guy is just a wealth of real life wisdom he was a worker he would go and record 17 sessions in a day um and what he told me about why it was him that they called ranged from uh, you know an anecdotal story about when he a guy called him uh because someone didn't show up he said he'd be there in 20 minutes when he knew very well it was going to take him 45 minutes to arrive right um to when you hear a, a a song you know a song like that the beach boys wrote and you're supposed to play the drum track to it for the radio version you have to contribute something to it right and so he talked about figuring out how to make this a sound on a cymbal by putting sand and rubbing a cup on there you know mm -hmm. And he was just cracked wide open, um, brave, no ego, and just tried everything he could think of and everything that came from his heart. And to, honestly, that that day changed my life in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> just, 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 and he, you know, because this this sage old man, right? He doesn't have anything to prove anymore whatsoever. So that was really a special day for me. Um, but then also the Mick Fleetwood interview, I actually did it here in St. Paul because they had come through. 
Um, and he is one, one of two um, drummers in the same band that he's been in since the 60s, Charlie Watts being the other one. Um, and, you know, very much a, a staple in the, you know, one of four staples in the band. My favorite part about that interview was just, it was everything he said I didn't expect whatsoever. He's this really tall, incredibly tall man with a wingspan that's even longer, <laughs> right? And so the guy can drum from across the room. Mm -hmm. um, and he just dove right into, when I asked him about his influence, he dove right into a jazz lesson, you know, and he talked about jazz and blues and the influence of African American music on the British singer songwriter bands that, you know, then were part of this British invasion that we consider, you know, that we consider all of that coming from somewhere else when in fact they are influenced by old music and from our culture that's even older. And I just learned a ton about the history of rock and roll and music from him. Um, and it just kind of slipped out of him. And it was a, it was a, it was one of the shorter interviews that I had. We were at his hotel in St. Paul. Um, but it was perfect. You know, it was just like, you couldn't ask for a better um, way of filling each second. It was just full loaded, really, really fun. And then, you know, the Charlie Watts, experience was really incredible because I've loved the Stones since I was 10. My dad, you know, is a product of, of, of the 60s and 70s. And, you know, just, I've been listening to this, to the Rolling Stones since I was a, a little, little kid. And I've always loved them. I love every song. I'm just a huge, huge fan. Um, and so it was, it was intense. That day was really intense because, it was the Rolling Stones and the security is up the wazoo and the only other people that are back there are, I think it was Jimmy Fallon, you know, who was like back there, you know, and then it, 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 it's like, we, it was a miracle getting in there. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that we had worked with Hal Blaine. Um, and also we kind of connected it with a, a promotion that we were doing for Zildjian. So we had their purpose in there too, but he just knows every drummer who has ever played and he has their instruments in a museum it is in, in, in england and he just he is such an incredible wealth of that particular uh, musicianship and you know we also got to see the stones do their sound check and it was just it was it was kind of like the day where you're like a kid in a candy store and you can't really believe it and you know we had the passes and it was really fun. So um, I think that's a long answer. I, if I had to pick Ooh, one. I, I love it. I could listen to you talk all night, I think. I, if I had to pick one, though, it would be Hal Blaine. And he, of course, most people don't even know who he is. Um, they know his music and they've heard, you know, a hundred songs that he's played on and they probably love 95 of them, uh, you know, and, but I think it's, I think it's, I think it's because of his age, you know, and his wisdom is just, peaked you know what I mean it's just at it, and um he, looking back you know he's looking back on all of it so he's just got a great perspective right really clear well I was gonna say I kind of like what you were saying about the sand on the symbol like just something simple like that not all this technology or whatever just thinking outside of the box and sharing those tips that's awesome Absolutely, you Fascinating. know, putting his heart into it and just being brave enough to try what he thinks might work, um, you know, and that gets him called, you know, Dean Martin he worked with, you know, Nancy Sinatra. I mean, he did all these films and TV shows, you know, it's like they, and, and he just had a ball. He just had so much fun and um, it was just re really inspiring. And then all the, I, I should say that working with Empty Hearts, the, I did all, I did, I interviewed all four of those guys and they're amazing too, because, you know, and they're from a really different era. Um, you know, and, and honestly, when, when, when Elliot Easton, like 
we were hanging out in the corner when we were shooting the music video and he started playing me his solo uh, to my best friend's girl, which was a song that I was obsessed with for, you know, a decade, like obsessed, like every mixtape I ever made. You know, I just, I'm a huge Cars fan. I've always loved Blondie. Blondie to me has been like, you know, that that band is um, very progressive female yeah. band you know yeah. i mean is yeah. that, so they also and and to be continuously working with them and to work again with them now is like it's such a dream it's so fantastic this is really fun <laughs> you have a fun you have a fun job you get to do I a lot have, of right? yeah i feel, I feel I like i'm gonna give you the opening to say tell us about some of the local folks that you're working with, both musicians and um, is it Project 410? And you, you get work with a lot of arts and arts and music and. I would love to tell you about that. Can you give me one second? I have to plug this guy in. I'm sorry yeah. about that. Is it okay? Will you be able to um, do anything with the recording? I'm worried that sure. it's going to go low. I'm so sorry. I should yeah. have plugged it in. Yeah. I, I have 100% battery. I'll be right back. Sorry. Okay. He's it's fascinating. Yeah, I would. Yeah, so I have. I've been so lucky to work with a lot of incredible bands right here in Minnesota, and some right here from Mankato. Um, worked with a band called Goodnight Gold Dust for a couple of years. I've done a few things with them. Um, you know, they've played it. They played at my studio a couple times. We did a music video with them um, called Second Moon. That was a really fun project, and. We, you know, we filmed a couple of their live performances. Nice. That was really fun. A singer songwriter from Mankato named Ian Hilmer is one of my all time favorite artists. Um, and if you don't know his music, you should check him out on Facebook. He's one of my favorite lyricists of all time, really. And he's a really nice. good friend. Um, just writes these perfect short songs that, you know, are just layered with meaning and uh, not precious in any way whatsoever, mm -hmm. but really beautiful. Um, I, and I've had a great opportunity to work with the Minnesota Music Coalition. So through them, I've met bands like uh, Mixed Blood Majority, Eric nice. Mason, um, you know, uh, Gambler's Daughter, um, some really just awesome bands that, um, you know, and, 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 and I did a lot of work for years with The Last Rebel, um, who have had great success. Um, I did, we did a really fun music video, I don't know, maybe four, three or four, three years ago, four years ago, um, for them. Uh, it was, the song was called Engine Trouble. And so we shot it at a, um, an old car, classic car garage. Oh, um, and we just had a ball. You know, it was really, really a fun project. Uh, so, you know, it, and, and man, and interviewing musicians who are emerging and who are, um, you know, finding their voice is even better than interviewing musicians who have lived the life for decades because they are hungry for what is coming, you know, and they have a voice that they need to use and they have a purpose in their music that you know is going to make a splash because it means so much to them so any chance i get to work with a band who is you know wor working to grow an audience or who is coming onto the scene or starting to um, you know, make a name for themselves and, and identify themselves. I love to do that. I love it. And, um, you know, it's, I think an important part of becoming, you know, it, becoming a musician is, you know, good, honest promotion. Um, and video is a great way to do that. You know, if you, if, if you've got the right ingredients and if you can say who you are, in the way you want to say it and um you know you can use the art of video to um add to the music right 
you, there's, it's, easy, it's easy to use video and have it take away, right? Because it's just not right. It doesn't fit. It seems shoved in. It's like a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. Um, and you see that sometimes because people, a band feels like they need it. And it's, if there's really low lighting and there's candles, you know, it'll be <laughs> sexy and get a bunch of hits or whatever. <laughs> if I have any advice for musicians in using video as uh, something that enhances what they're doing, make sure you love it. Make sure you are into it as much as you're into your music and make sure that it represents you um, in a way that your music represents you because otherwise it actually can become a liability instead of an advantage. Um, but man, if uh, like Eric Mason makes these really fun videos, if he does them and it's part of his art. And when, when, when the uh, Minnesota Music Coalition had to put their, uh, their summit on, you know, this platform yep. here. A couple weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, you know, he like did all this fun art. And Mix, Mixed Blood Majority found a stage, a sound stage to, to work on, you know, with the right vibe, you know, for their music. And like, at, at this time, and my friend Ian, has put more of his music out to the public since COVID ha happened than he had for a, a couple of years, you know, prior, you know, cause he was just, he was doing a lot of, uh, of, of shows, you know, he was going out and playing live a lot, but now, but like he, he got, he, he picked up his phone and just started recording his songs in his, uh, you know, his home studio. Um, and, people who have never heard of him got to enjoy the music, you know? So um, don't be afraid to do that. You know, definitely get grungy, you know, get with, with, with using video right now more than ever, because um, we can still hear the music and we can see who you are, you know, playing the music. And that is just awesome. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes it's really good to have even just a simple uh, music video and definitely, you know, an opportunity to tell your audience who you are and what you love and what you, what matters to you, why you're doing what you're doing. Not to totally age myself, but I can remember the early days of MTV. Remember they used to do music? Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. was, I was just out to eat with my dad and I heard the kinks come dancing, come on. Oh my God. I remember that video so I well. I loved that one so much, you know, and I just think I, I, I miss the era of. Yeah. And you know, it's really interesting because MTV uh, was such an awesome thing when it started and it yeah. was free and it was, pu it was, it was public broadcast, you know, basement broadcast television at its best. Um, and, you know, it's really kind of really sad what happened to them. And that's why I, I, there's a, there's an image in um, the 80s section of the music video, you know, with the two guys pulling the MTV logo and it breaks apart. And the reason I use that is because, and then, and then later towards the 2000 section, but right before we get to the lyrics and we're fully in present time, you know, um, I showed a real, you know, a, sp a spot from a reality show that's now on MTV, um, you know, and boy, talk about things that make me feel insane. <laughs> Yes. Um, and yeah, so, you know, and, and people were talking about the music too, you know, the music videos were incredible and they were really artistic and a lot of fun. Some of them were super shooting from the hip, you know, some of you, you there's some, there's some that they put a lot of money into, but some of them were, you know, just people working with what they could come up with and really creative stuff. And we're in a place now where we can do that. You know, we can do that work without the big budgets. And I've done work for bands that you would think have big budgets that do not have big budgets. And we have found ways, you know, to, to make it creative and, and to, and to get the work out there. Um, and honestly, this video that, that we're talking about here today is an example of that. Um, and so I just, I highly recommend anybody who's working to get their name out there, you know, use that medium. Um, and, and and don't forget that it can be just as creative and just as a part of what you are as a musician, um, as, as your lyrics or your melodies. 
I'm excited if this time does accelerate people going back and using video as, um, like you said, getting out there and stuff. Because I do think it kind of captures who they are and what that just gets, uh, grab somebody a different way than maybe their music would too. Absolutely, 100%. I think it would, I think it'll create, you know, um, an avenue to an audience um, that they, that they won't, sadly won't have for a little while. You know, yeah. I know that, um, yeah, the big, the big tours and the, and the big venues are closed, but, you know, a lot of the bars and, you know, other places that you, that you see um, smaller groups getting to play at are, are, aren't even going to be available to play at for a while and that's that's sad so you know use the pain <laughs> write a song <laughs> it, make a video <laughs> well i think earlier today i saw that you know charlie power liz draper kyle ola and i so sorry that i can't remember the fourth starting on their boat tour and they started in south st paul and there i am I watching that. them i love that and i've interviewed charlie i interviewed him um at the uh um at the Rock Bend Folk Festival in St. Peter Fun. a few years ago, and I shot his uh, performance at the Mankato Brewery. And he is a guy who will do whatever, you know, it, it, whatever it takes in the moment yep. to get to his audience. And he's always been that way. And yep. he's a great example of, you know, a, a, of a homegrown musician who's got it just as good as anybody you ever hear. Uh, you know, on the radio or on the big screen, and would and know and knows himself, you know, and knows how to do something innovative like a freaking boat tour. I love that. I think it's it was, awesome. It, and of course, this morning woke up in St. Paul. It's pouring rain, and I think, oh, but somehow the sun shone when they needed it to, and then they went off. And Heather, you'll have to help me where they're where they're going to land in a couple days. Um, I think they were going to go to Winona and then end up in um, Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin. Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin. That's right. That's yeah. right. I just so awesome. It is. Yeah. It's you know the necessity, the, the mother of invention. Here we've got. <laughs> well, that's where real art comes from. Always, it's always been true, and we have you know a lot of new necessity going on. So, um, I think that it can definitely spark some great invention and we'll see that happening. I hope around us and uh, you know, Venmo, these, these musicians got to use their Venmo accounts, you know, because people will do what they can because yeah. your, your fans love you, you know? And I, and I know that that's been uh, a cool thing to see again. It's a technology thing, right? It's just, it's, it's it's a tool. Use it. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Tell folks how to find you. We'll yeah. put this we'll put this in the post too and with your permission we'll include the video that we've been talking about because it's so awesome. I might make sure that I spread the word, but tell how can how can folks best reach you? Absolutely. Um, I think probably the best way is to go to my website or or my Facebook page. Um, you know, you can find me my my business Facebook page is True Facade Pictures. Uh, that's my website as well, True Facade Pictures, T R U E F A C A D E pictures.com or True Facade Pictures on Facebook. And, um, you know, you can find me on YouTube and, Vim, uh, and uh, Vimeo. Um, but those are probably the best ways to, to reach me. There's a contact page on my webpage, um, my numbers on my Facebook page. And, you know, um, anybody who is interested in any of the work I'm doing or, um, you know, interested in working with me on something. I am all ears. I love, I love new projects. Um, I'm going to be in town, you know, for a while. Um, and I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited about what that's going to bring. And I'm excited to make more connections and deeper connections to our um, Minnesota music scene um, and the scene in the Twin Cities and, you know, do what I can to, um, play along and contribute to, you know, the situation that we're in. Um, and uh, I appreciate 
any 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 feedback on on any of the work, any suggestions, any recommendations, any communication whatsoever. So truthsidepictures.com or you can check me out on Facebook, Truthside Pictures on whatever the backslash Facebook thing is. <laughs> they can find it. They can find it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you. Thank you so much thank for being you. with us. Oh, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking all this time and uh, speaking with me. And thanks for everything else that you're doing. I was going to say, I can't wait to s hear your podcast. You're going to have to let thanks. us know about that, too. I will. I, trust me. I will. When I, when I, when I, I think it's probably going to be a fall project. Um, when my kid gets back to school, I hope. If she can. <laughs> Um, you know, for her sake as, as well as mine. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm having a fun time outlining it. I think that it's going to be something that, you know, will work well alongside uh, my work in the music world. And I will certainly uh, maybe even call for some advice. Okay, well, <laughs> <I know> you <laughs> you're <good>. kind. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks great. so much for the time. This has been really great. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Have a great day. Your stories. <laughs>